20.5 million Americans losing their jobs in just one month. And every one of those jobs represents a family that has been appended. So it's hardly any surprise that President Trump has said that we must get the economy going again, no matter what. And he recognizes there are certain risks involved in doing that, even if it means certain health and certain loss of life, potentially. It really seems an unthinkable choice, really, but let's be honest with ourselves. We know that sooner or later we have to get the economy going again. We also know that it's going to entail some risk. The question is how much risk and how best can we manage that risk? And so we begin tonight with what we're told is a painful choice between tens of millions of people out of work on the one hand, and on the other hand, those whose life could hang in the balance. And to help us address that question, we welcome now Wall Street Week special contributor Larry Summers of Harvard. He was, of course, Tre Secretary of Treasury. Uh, Larry, thanks so much for being back with us. We've talked about this. Obviously, we want to be cautious in really start restarting the economy again. At the same time, when you see that many people out of work, doesn't it mean we have to get going? It conveys that we've got a need to do something. We've got to make sure those people are able to continue to live, which is why very, very strong unemployment insurance that's fortified for this moment is going to be absolutely uh, essential and why the Congress is going to have to move to extend what's been put in place so that it's securely there for people that's as long as necessary. It says that we, we need to move with all deliberate speed, but if we do it in a way that starts the pandemic up again, then in the end, the people aren't going to come back uh, to uh, their jobs because they're going to be afraid uh, to go to work, and the people they serve in stores or restaurants are going to be afraid to go out of their houses. So we've really got to make a priority um, out of uh, doing uh, what's necessary to enable us to move forward. And that goes back to masking, it goes back to testing, and it goes back to contact tracing. And we're not spending 10% uh, as much on those things as we are on uh, the relief efforts. And that's something that we're gonna need uh, to fix if we want to be able to have a viable economic recovery. Hope, David, is, is not a strategy. And simply letting us open up in the hope that more people will uh, be hired is probably a prescription for getting a second wallop uh, from uh, this virus. And that's not going to serve either economic objectives uh, or uh, moral objectives. But yes, we absolutely can't just accept this. It's no argument for fatalism, but it's an argument for the right kind of economic strategy. But the first plank in that uh, right economic strategy is an aggressive health strategy. And unfortunately, we're still not seeing that. So we heard from Larry Kudlow this week, and he said that as a practical matter, we will never have to shut it all down again because we've built up so much infrastructure since the epidemics first came here that we now have the wherewithal that even though there will be flare-ups, the president admits to that, we'll be able to contain it. Does that sound right? Sounds like nonsense. It sounds like something he wishes is true. I mean, talk about contagion. The president's penchant for confusing what is with what he wants to with what he would like to be true seems to be contagious to the people who work for him uh, in uh, the White House. Unfortunately, we don't even at this late date, we can track a presidential election every day. Pepsi can track the sale of Fritos every single day. The government of the United States of America cannot track every single month or every single week the incidence of a pandemic. We don't have the data. We've got data on how many people have been tested positive, but since we don't have tests for most people, that data is telling us as much about how many tests there are as how many people have the disease. It is incredible that in this age, of data science, of social media, of information technology, 
of artificial intelligence that the most rudimentary kind of tracking information is lacking and that we are being thrown back on what was the 14th century solution to the plague. Everybody go to the country and stay at, and stay in their own houses and not meet anybody they don't live with. Um, it is extraordinary to me, and I don't know what Cutlow's. I don't know what Cutlow's talking about. Show me some infrastructure that the administration has developed. They've turfed the problem to governors who have lacked the necessary uh, resources, and some are doing uh, better uh, right. than others. But the stunning right. thing is the plateauing right. of uh, of this uh, virus. And so, yes, it's true. We're not going right. to ever, right. I anticipate, have another month when we lose another 20 million jobs. But if right. we want the right. better half of those 20 million jobs to right. be coming back, we need to get on our horse and do something. Right. So, so, Larry, everything you say raises the natural question, why? Uh, we have a lot of people in the private sector, the public sector, e even charities such as the Gates Foundation who are devoted to this. Why aren't we fixing those problems? There's an obvious answer and there's a deep answer. The obvious answer is custody and competence. And we've just got vast amounts of sort of inconceivable levels of incompetence at the federal level. And that needs to be said before anything complex uh, is said. But there is a complex problem. Take the area of tests, David. If you thought about, if you had a potential test that you thought was really good, that was cheap, that used saliva, that could be mass produced, and you were thinking about producing it, you would need to know one of two things. You would either need to know that your test was going to be selected and you had a high confidence that you'd be able to go into vast production with it, and then you'd be willing to do it. But if you thought that there were a lot of people trying and you might win the lottery, but more likely than not, you wouldn't. You'd need to know either that you were going to be insured for your costs if you didn't win the lottery, or you'd need to know that if you did win the lottery, you were going to win some kind of massive surprise. But in the decentralized system with 50 states that we have now, people thinking about developing those tests know that they won't get reimbursed for their costs if their thing isn't selected, and that if their thing is selected, they won't be allowed to make massive profits because it'd be immoral to profit on a huge scale in the midst of a national emergency. And so the incentive to drive something uh, to completion just isn't uh, there in the way we're managing this. We need an aggressive federal program that encourages every development and reimburses people for their costs. And when they don't, uh, and provision for providing a big reward for people who develop ultimately successful vaccines. If we had that, we would be doing much better. But look, to have any kind of environment for doing anything succeed, you need signals that have some character of constancy, some predictability. And no company could effectively manage a supply chain if its CEO was announcing different things on odd number days and on even number days. And that's the situation that the federal government has us in right now.